welcome everybody again uh, to the last session, uh, which will comprise of um, the last paper today by Alenka Zupancic. Uh, she is a research advisor at the Institute of Philosophy of the Research Center and a professor of the, at the European Graduate School in SASFE in Switzerland. She is a social theorist, philosopher, um, uh, working obviously in the field of Lacanian psychoanalysis, and yeah, she is the author of um, all totally all, all the books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not good, remarkable books. Uh, uh, I will just uh, list. I, I could just uh, I could list uh, all of them, but um, only only two mo most recent, 2017. Uh, what is sex? Um, with uh, MIT Press and last year, uh, Let Them Rot, Antigonus Parallax, which came out with uh, Fordham University uh, Press. And the title of her talk today is Desire versus Perverse Moralism. Alenka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bustian, also for organizing this uh, conference. Uh, it's been a long day and a very productive one, very interesting one, uh, but I guess we are, at least some of us, already kind of a bit tired. So what I will present here, uh, I guess it's a very simple idea. I don't want to bring in all the heavy ulteriorly of this kind of, uh, not really opposition, because desire versus perverse moralism, perhaps this versus is not the best way of putting it, but I do think that they are quite antinomical, like this. So what I will do, I guess, hopefully, is to bring some hysterical tones into this discussion of perversion. Uh, okay, so no big news. There are many facets that are at stake in psychoanalytic and more specifically on the, like, in the Lacanian concept of perversion. Some of them can strike us as counterintuitive, not really people here. We've been discussing this the whole day. For example, that when Lacan shows how there is a kind of very significant trait of moralism very often at work in perversion, particularly in the Sadian perversion. Uh, so perversion does not simply take the form of some whatever, transgressive debauchery, uh, but involves a system, a philosophy, we could say, uh, with often a distinct moralist coloring to it, even when it, when it rises against common morality. Hence the famous écrit Kant with Zad. Uh, in, on a more general level, I would uh, say that perverse moralism, albeit in perhaps less interesting and elaborated literary form, is also an important component of some kind of more general tones generalized perversion that dominates much of our social interactions and even political engagement. Um, as I think was already mentioned this morning in uh, the discussion, uh, Catherine Barnett Phipps, one of my students, coined this very good expression that I really like, ordinary perversion, which is not exactly the same thing as just generalized perversion, but precisely this kind of uh, way also in which, like, say, or ordinary neurotics act like perverts or take upon themselves this act. And I think this is a very useful concept. And I also believe that uh, if in Freud's time neurosis has been kind of predominant uh, psychosocial modality of normalcy, uh, this has changed and this ordinary perversion kind of is taking the, the lead now, perhaps, is becoming the new normalcy, as we like to say. Uh, of course, by ordinary perversion, I don't want to suggest that perverse practices, whatever this may be, are becoming simply more acceptable and widespread and hence normal. Uh, I guess this stance or perspective would itself be a kind of moralist one, and it does in take often uh, partakes in this perverse logic of preaching about all this perversity going on. This is not at all what I am uh, aiming at here. Um, 
So I think something else is at stake with this ordinary perversion, uh, which obviously is at stake already with uh, the concept of per perversion as such, which I think could be defined by two main traits, and they both follow from the specific mechanism that already Freud put at the heart of perversion, namely disavowal. Uh, I've written and talked a lot about disavowal recently, and don't be afraid, I won't repeat this. Uh, I'll just uh, bring up or point to a couple of things. First is the disavowal functions as a kind of double insurance. And I think this also is something that came up in Adrian's talk, this kind of uh, redoubling the, the fetish, that, that, that really makes it a fetish. Double insurance um, against what we could call in a simplest way a reality check which functions, for instance, somewhat like this. Uh, I don't know or I don't want to know about something or simply I cannot know about it and then circumstances force me to acknowledge it even if it is unpleasant or disturbing, if this is some kind of reality check. In relation to this, this evolval is a kind of preemptive strike of knowledge. So I actually precipitate myself, I hurry to declare that I know all about it. Because obviously perversion is not this kind of denial of castration. It says obviously there is castration if we talk about this kind of primal notion in Freud. Uh, 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 you hurry to declare that you know all about it and this declaration of knowledge is supposed to keep you safe from, let's say, the, the real that this knowledge uh, transmits. It's the, the famous uh, Manonian, je sais bien mais comme même. As a kind of magical thinking almost. Uh, so there is an absolutely central place that perversion allocates to knowledge. Uh, and this knowing all about it or knowing also better than others what everything is about is also what colors this position with moralist tones. And, but the point of perversion is not to transmit to others what one knows, but above all to transmit to others that one knows. That one is the, the one who knows. And again, this is something that also uh, came up in the discussion this morning. I think Adrian uh, pointed it out. So, but there is this double uh, facet of knowledge. There is uh, trying to make known that one knows, that one is quite content with this knowledge, uh, but also there is this dimension of the expert knowledge about what others desire, or particularly what the other desires. Um, so the, the knowledge is a kind of object of knowledge, and this operation in which knowledge becomes the main object of knowledge functions, again, as a fetish that protects us against uh, the real, to put it simply. So what is this real? Freud's answer was castration, but I think we should perhaps uh, recede a little bit. I mean, this word is bound to kind of put an end to discussion rather than open it, uh, because I think what is really interesting here is precisely uh, uh, this idea which is also related to this, the idea of lack, of lacking the other and so on, which leads directly to the question of desire. And so I will simply put this on the table, my, my suggestion, namely that perversion is a defense against desire. Um, you know, there is a well-known Lacanian dictum according to which desire is a defense against jouissance, against, as he puts it, going beyond a certain limit in jouissance. This is from Seminar 7. But I think that the reversal of this formula rings even truer, perhaps, at least in our times, there is a certain knowledgeable, instrumentalized resource that serves as a defense against desire and its, let's say, ethical rather than moralist attachment to lack and to truth as informed and deformed, indeed as modeled by uh, this lack, but something, by something that is not there. And I think, by the way, that this Lacanian uh, saying the truth is not whole can be, not all, not whole, can be understood in precisely this way. Not that truth is always partial and cannot cover the whole of the reality, but rather that the only way to cover the whole of reality is to include or count in it 
what is not part of this reality. And precisely the it that desire refuses to recognize in reality or identify it with any empirical object of reality. Hence, its motto, that is not it. Um, we'll return to this. But in this way, I think truth as not whole can be seen precisely as truth carrying in itself the lack of being or the non-being on the repression of which the being is constituted. So the missing part of truth is essential component of its truthfulness, we could say. Okay, knowledge also plays obviously an important role in desire, but differently from perversion, it is not my knowledge, but the knowledge of the other, that is uh, the question, the enigma, whatever. Um, perverse knowledge is or pretends to be the knowledge about what the other wants even if she wouldn't admit to it, for instance. It is about knowing better than others what is, or rather should be, again, there is this moral, uh, good for them. It is knowledge about the desire of the other, as means of also mastery of this desire and, let's say, the, the lack that it kind of sustains. Uh, perversion, and I hope you can recognize in this what I mean by a generalized, even socially imposed perversion, uh, claims that what we, a subject of desire, want is to enjoy. Uh, I think this is some, something that we hear usually quite openly from all sides. Uh, and also kind of important part of our global capitalist social economy is to let us know and uh, make us accept that what we really want is to enjoy. Uh, and I think this is not only true for the so-called liberal societies. I mean, capitalism is universal, but there are liberal, less liberal uh, capitalist society. And I think this is also true for the societies that are not supposedly liberal in this sense. Uh, this idea that you need to enjoy differently in order to really enjoy. For instance, in more traditional or simply culturally different ways. So in its compound with knowledge about our desire, enjoyment is made, I think, to function as the kind of homologized object of desire, that is, as the right thing with a capital T that can satisfy the desire its true complementary object. And uh, mischievous, uh, erroneous preposition, pre uh, presupposition of this being that what the desire wants is enjoyment, or that in truth or unconsciously the subject of desire wants to enjoy. So I think we could say perhaps that what we, we are facing socially uh, could be defined as a kind of forcing of desire, or as an attempt to attune it to enjoyment, to surplus enjoyment, as its complementary object, precisely so far as desire has no complementary object. This is the very essence of desire. The so-called object cause of desire is not its complementary object. So we are dealing with a kind of bending of the structure of desire that aims at kind of cheating, forcing the desire out of its constitutive split. Uh, the primal cry of desire is not, I want to enjoy, but social conventions or depressions prevent me from enjoying or finding satisfaction. Rather, and as Freud saw quite clearly, the primal cry of desire is, I refuse to enjoy. Uh, the, the presupposition that deep down everybody wants to enjoy is completely at odds with the key insights of psychoanalysis. Uh, because this is a insight went beyond the simple uh, psychologizing of the problem which goes like this usually, well, if you don't want to enjoy, this is because you have some issues. Huh? It's the pathological state uh, which you can overcome. So it is not normal not to want the enjoyment, to refuse it or, or repress it or whatever. But contrary to this, 
Freud claimed that in a way this was the very definition of normalcy. This is how okay, psychoanalysis starts yeah, with neurotics. Uh, and I think what, um, what Lacan added to this is that this refusal or reluctance to enjoy, or rather refusal to accept this trait and to take enjoyment as the object that would satisfy my desire, also has an ethical and also could have a political dimension. So for not only is desire different from the need and its satisfaction, uh, we should insist also that enjoyment is no more cut to the measure of desire than the satisfaction of a need is. So you know there is this well elaborated Lacanian genealogy of desire that starts from the need, let's say I'm hungry, uh, its articulation in speech, I demand food from my parents, and there is this margin constituted because of the object that satisfies the need, my hunger, misses the point of the demand, which is actually a demand not for this or that object, but the demand for love, for instance. So the, this margin, this gap, this void is the field of desire proper. Just one very short quote from Lacan. Desire is neither the appetite for satisfaction nor the demand for love, but the difference that results from subtraction of the first from the second, the very phenomenon of their splitting. So there is no desire without this split. But, and precisely this is well known, but I think we should add to this that the question, the question of enjoyment enters the scene from the other side of speech, not simply from this uh, need and, um, uh, and love difference. Enjoyment enters the scene from the other side of speech uh, as it's unexpected, almost a kind of a surprising, but nevertheless quite essential surplus byproduct. Uh, which, of course, is there because of a certain negativity of the structure, and this is something that uh, Adrian was also discussing in, um, within the Marxist uh, conceptual apparatus. Uh, but so, so desire, we could say, exists between these double scissors. Not only we don't get what we want, on top of this we get something that we haven't even asked for. Surplus enjoyment or whatever. And desire refuses to take the latter, as the substitute for the missing object, and to say, yeah, yeah, that's it. So not only in relation to the satisfaction of the need, but also in relation to enjoyment, desire can only say, that's not it. Uh, to accept the trade with enjoyment in a way, is a way of giving up or seduction to son désir. That is not to say, I think, that the, the subject of desire cannot or must not or should not enjoy. It simply means that the enjoyment cannot be taken as something that satisfies the desire or as a true complementary object of, uh, of desire. And just a very obvious example, if you desire someone, for instance, experience desire in relation to them, the only acceptable response is for them to desire you back or desire you as well, and not uh, that they try to make sure that you enjoy, that provide you with more and more enjoyment, I don't know, in the form of multiple orgasms or something else. I mean, you can immediately see that this is not uh, something that is um, actually wanted. Uh, so, there is no relation between desire and enjoyment in this sense, which does not mean that they cannot coexist, but they coexist on a different, different levels or planes, we could call them like this. Uh, and uh, we could uh, see perversion as a kind of forcing of this structure of non-relation, whatever, forcing desire to recognize enjoyment as its true object. By knowledgeable intensification of desire, perversion not only aims at making the other admit that she wants it, but also and furthermore to demand it, to actually ask for it, and to say, yeah, yeah this is what I want. Uh, and this is the, the kind of point of true uh, triumph for, for, for the pervert, it's, it's at least a certain 
species of it. And I mean, there are several examples. I've already discussed at some length some years ago uh, the case of Valmont from Liaison Dangereuse, which is a clear example of this. Uh, but one really quick example could be, I hope you've all seen David Lynch's movie Wild at Heart. Uh, but there is this famous scene uh, already discussed many times between Laura Dern and William Defoe, uh, which starts with him really intruding her space in a violent attempt to, to seduce her. And the scene ends with her saying, fuck me, uh, which he kind of squeezes out of her, makes her, coerces from her. Uh, to which he then responds most casually, uh, sorry, some other time perhaps, I, I have to go now. So there is this kind of intense scene that the moment she, she kind of spells it out, spells it out, she, he drops it. So now I think perhaps, uh, I mean, this is just an idea that just only came to me, so I, perhaps it needs to, some time to, uh, uh, to mature or to, to, to prove if it is worth considering, but... Um, I think that in a way we could say that this is precisely how the infamous capitalist consumerism works. Not simply by making us suffocate in satisfaction offered by hundreds of objects that populate the field of desire and all these choices that we have. And also not simply by disappointing our desire in the sense that the moment we get this or that object, we can only declare that is not it and in fact experience the, the kind of um, drama of deception there because this is also what happens to desire. It's not simply that's not it, it it's a drama. Uh, no, I think the situation is in fact more perverse. It is as if the disappointment that that is not it uh, was already an integral part of the objects themselves that impose them in this way, that impose themselves in this way, as so many variations or whatever of the same object. Namely, I think it is as if these objects, consumerist object, whatever, and the way they are produced and presented to us as uh, part of the market logic and so on, would say the moment we buy them and thus declare that we want them, we would say something like, sorry, some other time, perhaps I've got to go now. Uh, you see what I mean? Uh, we don't even get the drama of experiencing that that is not it. We are left to choke on our demand of enjoyment or on the it in the form uh, of a demand. Or another way perhaps of putting this, again going back to some things that have been already said, is that it seems that uh, perversion circulates uh, simply on the level of circulation of these objects with themselves already, th there is no need for a sadist subject that would say, sorry, some other time. It's actually already part of the logic of the, these objects that we are trading with. Uh, and of course, this has consequences far beyond individuals and their way of tackling with uh, these problems. Um, for the form or scope of socially articulated demands has also narrowed down to some version of demand uh, to enjoy. This kind of forceful narrowing down to a demand to enjoy. Um, I don't know. A very obvious example, nowadays the simple demands for social justice sound completely ridiculous and boring. I mean, what is this? But the demands um, that at least, I mean, this is just because it's part of the logic, demands of this or that so-called interest group uh, to get this or that seems to be uh, at least uh, reasonable even if not um, even if contested or unac deemed unacceptable. But the logic, at least, is kind of familiar. And I'm not talking here about the difference between um, the cause, let's say, uh, to, uh, to change the system, systematic change, and the cause for improvement within the given system. Uh, but really, I think there is the difference here precisely between the structure of desire and that of enjoyment. Um, enjoyment is flexible and easily interchangeable, even if it is, uh, but it's kind of, 
it does move in this sense. On the other hand, the lack on which the desire is predicated is unflexible. Uh, and it introduces a possible kind of uh, universal call or consequence in spite of or in the very singularity of desires, attachment uh, or demand on uh, this or that particular object. In other words, uh, so there are these two very interesting um, layers of desire that uh, work together. If the fundamental statement of desire, which also characterizes its metonymical, supposedly endless movement, is that is not it, we should never lose sight of the other side of this movement. Desire's perseverance, stubbornness, refusal to yield, to give ground, and so on. So, yeah, desire involves an absolute condition. The two sides are inseparable and operate together. So if desire operates by persistently proclaiming that that is not it, it is not because it is so picky and not satisfied with anything, but because the structure with which and from which it emerges is kind of itself based on a nothing, on a nothing that exists as a kind of a gap or negative magnitude uh, which is the true cause of uh, desire, the it, so to say. And I think, um, okay, I know there are many problems also with uh, this top topology, but uh, I think it's very interesting perhaps nowadays to bring this in that <clears throat> Lacan's key move was to uh, de-psychologize the notion of desire. Uh, and to start out from what we may call a kind of imbalance uh, of being, a symbolic, that is to say, with a being constituting itself around something falling out, to put it very uh, brutally. So being qua being is the other side of something falling out of being. And he posits that the subject, qua subject of desire, emerges from this imbalance of this lack of being, by way of precisely subjectivizing it in this or that way. In other terms, subject is the way in which the imbalance, the negative core of structure appears, takes place as an event within the structure itself. This is the event of desire, precisely. It is something which, within the structure that gave rise to desire, brings to the fore the gap that gave rise to it. Desire in this way somewhat, is somewhat like a play within the play, Hence, perhaps, it's often theatrical aspect uh, associated especially with hysteria. It plays out, it performs, it reenacts uh, the very excluded, fallen out condition of its own existence. It reintroduces, it brings this absolute condition into play, into reality. And like the play within the play, just think of the mouse trap in Hamlet, for example, it is or can be at least a figuration of truth. Not its revelation or disclosure, but its figuration. And this fictitious figuration is the, way, the only way of inscribing into reality the real of an exclusion on which this reality is founded, exclusion that further on constitutes the ground of repression. And following from this line, I have a long reading, long, more extensive reading of what I found most interesting in so-called Afro-pessimism, but I won't uh, go into this now because I really think it relates to this logic. So in its most elemental structure, desire, signa desire signals the imbalance that sustains the order of being and aims beyond all objects to shake this order to bring about a shift in the order of being. This aim of the radical aim, let's say, and dimension of desire, of course, can get lost in everyday economy of desire, which certainly exists, for desire is also known for often actively sustaining uh, the order about which it complains or which it refuses and so on. But I think that this possible economy should not simply prevent us from recognizing the uh, inherently nevertheless upsetting as well as orientating dimension of desire uh, that I would say so plays a key role also in virtually all genuine eman emancipatory political struggles. And here also I have a long digression on the 
actually the, the, the recent event, recent uprising, whatever, in Iran, uh, which could be uh, a very, very good example. This is based on some analysis made by the Iranians themselves. But again, I will simply continue and uh, conclude very quickly with my argument here today. Uh, as you know, desire and its concept also have a very interesting fate in psychoanalysis because understood as an emblematic figure of desire, uh, hysteria belongs to the very birth of psychoanalysis. We could say that it belongs to its conditions, to, to use Baduian parlance. Uh, so Lacan actually made it an unavoidable first step uh, of any analytic process. The beginning of analysis entails historization of discourse. This is right. This is the. If this doesn't happen, nothing will work. So, um, so this was interesting also in what uh, uh, today was saying about this uh, uh, sadist, sadist uh, impetus that actually historized in a way. Uh, um, the Redman, although he is generally conceived as the uh, uh, obsessional. Uh, nowadays, uh, instead of hysteria, we like to speak of, and this is official now, conversion disorder. Um, and the latter is defined as bodily symptoms such as numbness, blindness, paralysis, mutism, that appear in the absence of organic causes. And I believe that this is really a typical kind of psychological misnomer, to say the least. If anything, instead of conversion disorder, it would be much more appropriate to call it conversion of disorder. That is, turning of disorder into a bodily symptom. It is not the disease, a disease in this sense. It is a bodily conversion that signals a disorder in the big other itself, something that objectively exists, or at least affects, objectively affects the subject. So disorder is in the real, it is out there. And it is wrong to reduce it simply to a pathological reaction to some real that we should be able to deal with by other less drastic or extravagant means. Um, and we could say psychology is the means of this conversion, but not its cause. Uh, and I think there is also an important difference between the inability to cope with a traumatic reality and the desire to signal it to others, to make them see the traumatic character of some reality, or at least what you perceive as the traumatic, but nevertheless, it is about reality. Um, and when psychoanalysis speaks of historical theater, it is not simply to slur historical desire to imply that it is just an empty show. On the contrary, it is to recognize and acknowledge uh, the will, indeed the desire, to display that something is wrong or missing, to stage it and perform this fact, indeed to make a spectacle of it. Now, Hamlet just says there is something rotten in the state of Denmark, but hysterics make, pushes this further. Uh, there are empty performances, to be sure, uh, but they are such, like empty precisely because they kind of flag the, the, the truly hysterical dim dim dimension of drama here. Of course, hysteria is an unfortunate name because it goes back to theories that uterus, ancient Greek hystera, moves around in the female body and causes problems in various places, that is to say, causes the so-called hysterical symptoms. But perhaps as unfortunate as the name is, it is still better than the seemingly neutral conversion disorder. Um, why? You know probably how uh, Zizek likes to tell the story of how some Native Americans prefer the name Indian to Native American. Uh, instead of being associated with nature and nativism, uh, they claim that at least the name Indian testifies to the stupidity of the white colonizers who thought they had landed in India. And perhaps we should say something similar in the case of Hysteria. The name testifies, yeah, why not, to the stupidity of its original understanding uh, and carries the, the trace of the, the disorder in male-dominated social heaven, although I think there is even something more to it. But conversion disorder, on the other hand, 
conveniently places the disorder exclusively on the side of the suffering subject. Posit it as merely an inner conflict of the subject concerned. In this way, not only is any connection between the subjective and the social or objective cut off, uh, this is to say the possibility of a precisely subjectivized objective problem or conflict, uh, but also we could say the theater is closed. Although we live in a society of spectacle, but some dimension of theater disappears here precisely. It is sealed off. So with, if mutism, silence, is one of the common symptoms of hysteria, it is precisely because yeah, the silence cries out or screams loudly. Uh, and by that, I don't mean that it is a cry for help. No, it is a matter of a kind of drawing, yeah, our attention to something, of forcing us to look, to think about it, exposing, embodying the, the kind of disorder in heaven. So conversion disorder silences, the, the term silences precisely this uh, screaming of silence because it removes its dimension of the missive addressed to others. Um, at least in any meaningful way and justifiable way, um, which aims to cause, indeed, to provoke something in them, in the others. This is clearly hysterical intention. Very often to provoke desire, also the desire for the cause, for the same cause. To provoke uh, a response, to take a stance, whatever which is very different from the response that the perverse other seeks to provoke in us, which is to make or kind of force us to say that, say out, to spell out the it that we want, often based on the object that the perverse knowledge has tailored to the measure of the desiring subject. So force us to say the it that we want and then make us or our desire choke on this very demand as the kind of uh, slogan of enjoyment. Lacan has this nice expression, Jlindra Ujitka, the slogan of enjoyment. So in this way, perhaps, okay, this is a uh, kind of simple way of staging this, but we could say that the aim of perversion is perhaps the silence of desire. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alenka. It was brilliant. Questions, comments? Maybe to start, it's um, really at first glance, when you were talking about um, different objects A uh, as object of jusons uh, in relation to consumerism, that are usually something given to us and can function even without the subject in a sense that it's supposed that there is nobody to refuse to take them. Yeah, in the sense that this uh, sadist or whatever perverse proof, it's already built in uh, the way these objects are structured, yeah, and also how they uh, circulate, how they are presented to us, part of the network of which they are, yeah. Does this... I mean, I assume the answer is going to be yes, but uh, still, uh, does this apply also, um, talking in the context of the Seminar 17 and the discourse theory, um, to uh, uh, labor power as an uh, object A? Where to is what? La labor power? Yeah, uh, which is also like f functions uh, under the presuppositions that nobody would say, no, I won't take this. Yeah, I mean, um, labor power is, uh, is a way in which precisely, okay, this is Marx, but uh, the kind of objectification of something that is not an object to begin with. I mean, this is the, 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 very, uh, the, the very idea. So, yeah, the way it is made to function um, in this kind of circulation is precisely that, uh, I mean, for instance, one way of uh, thinking about this would to relate it to uh, what Marx says about uh, um, the labor market, that uh, it is very crucial that labor is being sold freely. The, 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 this is not labor, it's not slave labor. And that there is this essential 
uh, way in which it can only function, the capitalist uh, economy can only function if you can buy this labor on the market uh, because uh, others, th th it is being sold by free will. So it's not uh, the kind, uh, so yeah, in this way, it is the, the way it labor enters the, the whole um, production process as object uh, and moreover as object that is there um, by choice, let's say, of the, the carriers of this object, it, it functions precisely in this way. That uh, it is, it functions differently from, it's not only, precisely, it's not simply an object. These are objects endowed by a certain, let's say, subjective, even magical forces, mm -hmm. as was also uh, the point that uh, Marx was saying, because something um, is disavowed carrier or is missed or is cut off, yeah. So this magical, additional magical uh, capacities of, of this object are precisely the result or the symptom or whatever the consequence uh, of something that uh, yeah, goes uh, missing there and that feeds them in a way that they, they, they behave as they were subject. Mm. Thank you, Linka, for this. I mean, I don't have any associations or questions. I would just like to emphasize how uh, refreshing is simply to pay, pay attention to what, is the, to what is at stake in psychoanalysis, that is unconscious desire. I mean, it's really illuminating how slowly, carefully, paying attention to the details uh, you proceeded. So I think it's really uh, nice because in the last couple of decades we are somehow all the time thinking in terms of a drive against desire, desire doesn't want to be satisfied, it's metonymy, you know, you know. You know. And I think it's uh, also productive in a way how psychopathology of today can be taught. I mean, defense against desire is everywhere in these days, you know, because yep. people doesn't want to desire, they want to protect themselves. Uh, this, uh, this has many manifestations, like, uh, I mean, asexualism, um, etc., etc. So, uh, and uh, I think it's very important just to shift attention to what the desire in psychoanalytic reading really is, and that's really fine. <laughs> Yes, I like. Thank you. This was really great. Um, first, I think uh, just to sort of give you strength to the, 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 the I think that the example with the object I think is a very strong argument. Actually, it really it speaks to the structure of commodity as such. You know, just everyday phenomena. You know, you buy a car, it immediately loses value, right? If I, you sell it immediately out of the shop, it, it lost value. This is the mm -hmm. this is the the objectified incarnation of what you said. Maybe later. But once it turns yeah, yeah. into an object yeah. from a commodity, it is immediately lost value. Mm. So this is really somehow straight to your argument. And the, the other question, I mean, I, I somehow not only sort of liked, but you know, I, I find it important, everything you presented, and, and, and want to seek uh, even encouragement in it in somehow. But then my, my question to you is, what nonetheless is this truth effect of this, the, the, sorry, the, the, truth, the truth, truth effect? of this forcing of enjoyment. Because in that scene that you mentioned, that's part of its very troubling effect, that you cannot but avoid, you mm. cannot escape the feeling that he succeeds, that he pulls out of her something that was hum somehow her secret desire. That, mm. that is somehow ingrained in the effect. And we have this you know, general problem which repeats with perversion. Perversion is the core of neurosis is somehow and so, you know, I completely see your theoretical edifice here, but what do we do against, it? conceptually even, not uh, as, as a political mm -hmm. act, conceptually against this very powerful truth effect of that perversization, so to speak, of the hysteric, if one could put it that way. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you for this question. No, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I would relate this to, to some of the debates that we again had this morning. Uh, and um, it relates, I guess, to the question of uh, the 
proximity sometimes between psychoanalysis and perversion, which uh, Arthur brought out. So it would seem that this kind of gesture actually makes you a little bit in a violent way, but still spit out the truth of what you want. So tell us finally what you want. Uh, so that there is this effect. But what I argue is precisely that it is here that psychoanalysis operates a kind of neat separation between whatever, yeah, can give you enjoyment as a subject and between desire and the object of desire. This is the, the, uh, the kind of uh, fusing together that the perverse mood shift does and which I think is nevertheless the, the, the opposite, very different from precisely um, separating the enjoyment from uh, this kind of machine that... Uh, which is related to desire, uh, that fits it and uses it in, in all kinds of ways. And to the, so to, to just say that this is true, so finally, I don't know, she said, Laura said, so they, if we say, okay, so it seems that now she really wanted him to do, to do it to her, whatever. I think this is a completely wrong reading of the scene. Yeah, she did, but at the same time, she did not. And this refusal is as true and as important, and it's not that uh, the, the truth of desire is this hidden truth uh, of something that we would not admit. And this is also why I, I, th I think that no means no really matters, because if you say no, uh, this is uh, one, hell, even if there is, can be some kind of dialectical play, whatever, of, uh, uh, of further seduction, but in a way, uh, uh, if we just say that there is some kind of ultimate truth of desire, the ultimate truth of desire is that it is split. And if you want to, to honor the desire or to take it seriously, you have to honor the split, not simply like, okay, we are split between, but simply to say that, yeah, we can, uh, it is very, not only legitimate, but perhaps very subjectively affirmative not to want this enjoyment. Even if you uh, happen to come uh, across it, yeah. Lenka, I have a question for you about the introducing the concept of drive into the picture of the relationship between jouissance and desire that you track so nicely in your talk. And of course, you mentioned especially consumerist capitalism is really helping epitomize aspects of how desire functions in terms of the that's not it, you know, and the continual displacement from object to object characteristic of how desiring consumers are made to operate or to, to desire under capitalism. Um, but one thing that I'm wondering about is, you know, for at least from a Marxist perspective in relation to the Lacanian distinction between desire and jouissance, um, it would seem to be that, uh, you know, of course, consumerist desire of this sort is a, an echo of what, you know, at, at, the, at the level of the sphere of exchange, where in the marketplace we see this desire functioning in this way for consumers. But that, of course, that is what, the, at, in the sphere of production, the circuit of capital after World War II ends and after, you know, you have the, you know, the economic steroids of war mobilization keep profits going through, you know, keeping industrial capital in, in full flower, that once that, uh, uh, that stimulant for producing surplus value goes away, then consumerism becomes the necessary means for the circuit of capital like a Lacanian drive in terms of the repetitive circling of the loop of MCM prime ad nauseum. It's that desire there is very much an echo of basically what we could call capital itself as drive. I mean, if we think of the circuit MCM prime as functioning as this monotonously mm. repetitive drive that is self-enhancing and throws off surplus value, what are the implications in terms of looking especially for you at the political implications of desire under consumerist capitalism if following a kind of Marxist recasting of Lacan's distinction between desire on the one hand and, and drive and jouissance on the other, if we view it as, again, an echo or basically the consumer manifestation of what is still ultimately a drive at the level of production, um, it seems as though that might 
at least for some Marxists, call for some caution about thinking about the potential liberatory, emancipatory, or you know, more politically progressive dimensions of desire if it's viewed in this light. Uh, yeah, thank you, Adrian. Uh, no, I mean, I know that it probably this came across as a little bit as I, as if I am making the case of, okay, just let desire and this will <laughs> somehow liberate us. This is not what, uh, I, I, what I wanted, but I did want to bring it precisely in this kind of a more confrontational dialogue with, uh, with enjoyment. Uh, again, not as to say, okay, now after this, <laughs> plenty of discussion of drive and jouissance, let's move back to desire, to, because in this way, uh, play one against the other, but precisely, and this is part of this bigger project that I'm working on, precisely try to, um, to, 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 to see, to investigate, to research the, the relationship between drive and desire, their complicity as well as the really difference, and they, how they, simply because perhaps there are two ways of manifesting the same problem, but I think what desire has more or different than drive is that it kind of presents, at least from time to time, a handle where you can grab this system. Whereas enjoyment just slips through your hands to some way. So I'm not saying in itself, okay, desire is it, so we'll desire and we'll get emancipated or whatever. Uh, but it is something that kind of hurt, um, um, interrupts a certain, can interrupt a certain uh, process of smoothing, even though, yeah, you can argue that, uh, on the other hand, it is very much part of this uh, system, but I find it, at this point, at least, productive to, 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 to think about both the difference and the relationship between them. And actually, Lacan has a very interesting line, I forgot, uh, is this Seminar 11 or whatever, when he says that, uh, it's just the moment when he starts to in introducing the, the real concept of drive, which will become so important lately. And actually, he kind of uh, um, the, this, um, describes drive in the very terms that previously he described desire. There's this kind of uh, um, the, the object of the drive is not the, you know, the, the, it, and it moves around its object. But what he also says, and this is, I think, very interesting, that uh, their desire is empty. Uh, or kind of this superfluous whatever thing, if, uh, but if it's, not, if it's not agitated in the drive, or if drive is not agitated in desire. So uh, the idea is more that they, when they are really related, uh, the, the, I would, at least I read it like this in this way, when they are really related in, together, it is much more difficult to kind of uh, directly monopolize them in this way. Whether when you separate them uh, uh, and kind of separate, okay, very simply put, this kind of uh, negativity of desire and the supposedly just the positive, which is also this kind of romantic, you know, the drive is just about, you know, positivity and uh, what, uh, then you, both of them start to function as a very um, nefast uh, support of, um, uh, yeah, of whatever terrible things that we are <laughs> in or not. <laughs> uh, I mean, but it's a complicated question and I really, I mean, this is not a kind of excuse. I really uh, still need to work this out more uh, you know, precisely. Okay, I, I have a very, I'm going to try to keep it as quick as possible. But uh, I, wonderful talk, thank you. I especially in, uh, um, appreciate the uh, reversal you made uh, of that uh, Lacan quote of uh, jouissance uh, as limited by, by desire instead. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it comes very close to uh, actually one of the first systematic uses that Lacan makes of jouissance from Seminar 5, that the subject enjoys his desire. Um, it, so very, very nice. I, I do wonder about hysteria though, because um, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to think of a, a figure of pure desire uh, qua hysteric, just as it's impossible to think of an absolute jouissance. And in particular, I think the ordinary aspect of hysteria is actually uh, full of in, in enjoyment. I mean, you know, I mean, let's, let's be frank, it's uh, not only enjoying making man, but also of, of being, to put a little bit bluntly, a, a coquette, I mean, you know, and inciting desire in this way. You know, so it's the difference between mm. being the jewel in the jewel box that your father gives you versus slapping 
your substitute father when he says that his wife means nothing to you. And then the third moment, which is quite dangerous, and while I see exactly where you're going, uh, I think it's worth bringing up, is when hysterics themselves begin to enjoy their desire, enjoy slapping, mm-hmm. slapping people around. So I, I'm wondering, do you, do you agree that there's any uh, danger here in what you're proposed sort of solution, how, how to limit the sense in which jouissance is uh, jouissance desire. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. I think this, to, to some extent, also r- relates to the previous question. Uh, again, I did not want to present this as a solution to anything. I just wanted to introduce another topic, another topology into this discussion of enjoyment, perversion, and so on. And But I think, okay, uh, I mean, this could be a something that we could discuss later on, but this historical enjoyment, the, the, the enjoyment there, uh, I mean, this is finally what even brought Lacan to this question of perhaps uh, some other enjoyment, which would be uh, precisely an enjoyment that is, that is not directly, um, I mean, it's not directly caught in this uh, loop or in this, um, let's say, uh, self-fulfilling um, movement of the drive, uh, so of the drive or whatever. Uh, of, so I, I'm not saying that, uh, we, again, if this was the impression, I just think that there is something about hysteria that is important to think through and to keep on our, on the table, uh, even though we can say all these things critical about it, you know, yeah. The, the, uh, so it's, but I think that at some point what happened in this discussion is, yeah, 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 hysteria is just, they, they enjoy what they complain about, they, they, and I think something was lost in this, um, uh, in this move, although it could be to some extent at least clinically completely correct, but I think that something is, uh, is lost here and something that I, I really think uh, is re-emerging and in a way that is kind of, uh, I mean, even if uh, my point is not that, okay, if she enjoys it, then uh, everything that is, was brought as the truth of something in this configuration should be dismissed because she enjoyed it. This, in this way, we are back to this argument that as long as nobody enjoys it, we can, uh, you know. Uh, so it's, so yeah, she, enjo- I mean, uh, it's, you know how it is with enjoyment. You never, you cut it here, it reappears there, so you never, uh, enjoyment is the most uh, non-controllable thing that it is. So uh, I don't think that just because there is this enjoyment, we can, simply use it to discredit or to say, okay, uh, I mean, just this, but uh, it's just a precaution, but there are problems that I haven't um, addressed here with uh, uh, some of the configuration of hysteria, but still, I don't know, I still think that there is something about hysteria which is not simply uh, pointing out, let's say, the lack in the other, which is also part of it, but also, sometimes uh, involves a certain act that is pointing out. It's not simply pointing the finger, but doing something uh, that nevertheless forces everybody to deal with it. So we can say, okay, this is terrible, why why should we deal with it? And in many cases, uh, yeah, probably it's just uh, really not necessary. but, but there is a certain dimension uh, of, uh, uh, that, that is you cannot simply go on as if nothing happened. And I think most of the time, uh, huge things that are happening uh, to us, uh, uh, we just go on as if nothing <laughs> happened. So perhaps some degree of historization would not be so bad. But again, I'm not saying this is the solution to whatever. Uh, it's, it, it's not the question of solution here. It's okay, I don't see any hands anymore. So I would like to thank you, Alenka, again. And uh, yeah, since it was uh, the last talk and the long day, as you said, and you're all a bit um, yeah, tired already, <laughs> um, there is no, no, not going to be um, any long speech uh, to conclude this conference. I will simply declare this conference closed and uh, I hope 
Um, it was instructive and interesting, and I'm not going to say that I hope that all of you enjoyed it. So. Thank you.